terminating all exercise inputs. So, Grover, if you didn't know that the exercise... Oh, yeah. In fact, more hijackings were thought to be taking place. It's not a radar scope, and it's not just a video game. It's actually people's lives that you're trying to keep from running into each other. Other planes were thought to have been hijacked and almost shot down. An aircraft inbound to Whitehorse from Alaskan airspace was a hijacked aircraft, and that the military flight crews were aware of this, and they were en route to intercept the aircraft. Some of these war games and their details remain classified to this day. So is it any wonder that Donald Rumsfeld gave these warnings to military personnel the day after the attacks? Finally, I'd like to say a word or two to the men and women in the defense establishment, uh, most of whom deal with classified information. When people uh, deal with intelligence information and make it available to people who are not cleared for that classified information. The effect is to reduce the chances that the United States government has to track down and deal with the people who have uh, perpetrated the attacks on the United States and killed so many Americans. Later in the day, weapons are found planted on several other planes. A U.S. official says of the hijackings, these look like inside jobs. Sources tell Time that U.S. officials are investigating whether the hijackers had accomplices deep inside the airport's secure areas. And then there's the story of Flight 23. As bad as things were on Tuesday, there is a possibility that they could have been even worse. There was some kind of an altercation involving three men described by a Port Authority of New York and New Jersey police source as Middle Eastern in appearance. They attracted the suspicions of the gate staff boarding that flight. They had already gotten on the plane. They're asked to leave the aircraft. They refuse to get off. The airline, following its normal procedures, according to this police source, calls the police, which immediately dispatch an emergency service team. So now you have a squad of heavily armed officers that are coming toward the airplane. And when they get there, the men have vanished. The gate staff can't find them. It matches with the type of flights, the transcontinental flights, that were hijacked in the other four instances. Another disturbing fact, if indeed there was an altercation and these men felt they had a case to make and were being treated unfairly, you can't imagine they would have disappeared from the airport. They would have stayed around and, and pled their case with the police. It is extraordinarily unusual to have an airline, after it has boarded passengers, be so suspicious that it's going to ask these customers to get off the airplane. We got a phone call from a law enforcement officer who was on vacation, was in the United Airlines terminal at the time. As soon as he approached, they walked out of the terminal and he looked over. He described them as Middle Eastern in both appearance and dress. Not sure what that means, but that was his description. He said when they left the terminal through the glass doors, he saw them meet a third man and they then left. Inside the bags, officials found Al-Qaeda instruction sheets, but false identification prevented investigators from ever locating the bag's true owners. Coincidentally, the hijacker's identification would be found the exact same way. There have also been reports of uh, luggage that did not make the, uh, the plane connection that appears to be tied uh, to one of the uh, alleged perpetrators, and this is being reported by the, uh, the Boston Globe and uh, contained within the luggage were supposed to be uh, Arabic language flight training manuals as well as uh, uh, videotapes pertaining to uh, operating an aircraft. Then we have that mysterious suitcase with all of the hijackers names and all of this incriminating evidence that is supposedly taken by one of the hijackers to the airport why if they are planning on a suicide attack would they even bother to pack a suitcase or if they're just packing a suitcase to look like they're checking luggage just throw clothes in there why put a Koran? Why put flight manuals? Why put all this incriminating information if it's supposedly going to get burned up? And then magically, amazingly enough, this one suitcase doesn't make it onto the connecting flight to New York. And it's just there in baggage handling, waiting to be discovered and found. If the passengers on Flight 23 used false identification, why wouldn't the other hijackers? 
based on my personal belief and based on the events of that morning, um, the decision to halt airplanes, in all likelihood, probably precluded other attacks. Ada and three others would do dry runs of the attacks before 9-11. Actor James Woods and others on the plane even filed separate reports to the FAA. Again, nothing was done. I was on a flight uh, without going into the details of, of what made me suspicious of these four men, although it would have been blatantly obvious to the most casual observer. Uh, I took it upon myself to go to the flight attendant and ask to speak to the pilot of the plane. The first officer came out. I reported to him that I felt that the four men, and I said, can you look over my shoulder and see who I'm talking about? And he said, uh, yeah. <laughs> I said, I think they're going to hijack this plane. I mean, everything they're doing, and I explained to him these details, which I've been asked to keep private until whatever jurisdiction, you know, uh, whatever trials may take place. Uh, their behavior was such that, uh, that, that I felt they were going to hijack the plane. I found out later that not only was, did he make a report, but the flight attendant also made a report of my suspicions to the FAA. My friend Scott said to me, you know, remember that flight you took in August? I said, yeah, I've been thinking about it all day. He said, well, maybe you should call the FBI. And I said, I'm sure they're being inundated, but I thought it over and I called the local office. Quarter to seven the next morning, I get a phone call that actually wakes me up and he said, uh, we want to talk to you about the flight that you took in August. I said, oh, did the, did the manifest match of any of the flights yesterday and my, and my flight? He said, well, we can't tell you that. I said, well, look, I'll get ready and I'll, you know, I'll come down to the, uh, to the federal building. He said, we're outside your house. We'll just wait for you. Wow, 7.15. <laughs> so quarter to seven in the morning. I said, uh, and I, and this is the only funny part of any of this. I said, how did you know where I lived? And there was a pause. He said, uh, we're the we FBI. Know. We're right. the FBI. Thank you. So they came in and I said, look, I, I'm dying to know, were these the guys? And he said, well, we've had 36,000 tips in one day. And there's two of us and we're going to be at your house all this morning. So you can do the math, but we can't tell you, you know. So mm -hmm. since then, I have identified for sure uh, two of them as two of the terrorists. Really? Uh, who actually were not on flight 11, but one was on flight 175 and one was on flight 77. And I've been told unofficially, not by the FBI, but by someone else in a, actually a higher level of government, believe it or not, just through a coincidence, through a mutual friend, that all four of them were terrorists involved. As I explained to the FBI, they said, what was your first instinct? And aside from certain things like four guys getting on a transcontinental flight without any hand luggage. They said to me, you know, what, made, what did you think these guys were? I said, well, I thought they were the four law enforcement officers or four terrorists in that they had that right. thing that guys who are undercover or on a mission have between each other. Just more evidence that the hijackers had intelligence ties. There were almost certainly other targets. Maryland's governor on the morning of 9-11 stated that his police department had received threats prior to the attacks, not only against the targets that had been hit, but others. That came in today? Pardon? You, you mentioned threats on, on uh, Maryland facilities. Are these threats that came in today? Yes, our, the uh, head of our state police, Dave Mitchell, uh, received a uh, list of uh, 11 uh, uh, sites across the country uh, that were uh, targets uh, supposedly this uh, list had been distributed prior to the explosions. Uh, several of those sites uh, were ones that were uh, under attack. Another target on that morning was Air Force One. Although it is never discussed, the perpetrators of the attack somehow got top secret codes that morning. And Brian, what is the credible evidence that Air Force One could have been a target? Uh, these planes were some distance from Air Force One after all. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the excuse was that, quote, we do not discuss, you know, we do not discuss intelligence information. Uh, Air Force One has been said to be a target in the past uh, during President Clinton's trip uh, to Bosnia uh, during his first term where they stopped in Aviano and switched out into three transport planes. Similarly, they were escorted by fighter jets as they have in the past while it is not routine. Uh, the White House uh, insisting that the uh, evidence was and thus the zigzag flight path from Florida to Louisiana, the Air Force is insisting that the evidence is provable and credible that the aircraft and the White House were targets. Ari Fleischer, the White House press secretary, would be pressed on this issue. If, if you have a threat to Air Force One, it seems as though you're raising an, an additional threat that perhaps we don't know about. I'm sorry, raising an additional threat? Involving one of those it's planes, over. Yeah, one of those four planes, Ari, is, is that where the credible threat, or can you say 
Are we, are we talking about no, something totally different? You're asking me, in essence, what the source of information is. And I think the American oh, people... No, 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 no. How Go have ahead. we accounted right. for those four planes and what their targets were? Is there, which, by deduction, you would assume there is something else that we're talking about targeting Air Force One. There Maybe was... Make that assumption? Uh, I'm not going to lead you any further as to speculating about what was the nature of the threat to Air Force One. But as I indicated, and I'll say it again, it was real, it was credible. that we have accounted for. I'm just not going to speculate about the nature of it. On September 20th, 2001, WorldNet Daily would report much more regarding the threat. The terrorist message threatening Air Force One was transmitted in that day's top secret White House code words. As the clock ticked away, the Secret Service reached a frightening conclusion. The terrorists had obtained the White House code and a whole set of top secret signals. This made it possible for a hostile force to pinpoint the exact position of Air Force One, its destination, and its classified procedures. In fact, the hijackers were picking up and deciphering the presidential plane's incoming and outgoing transmissions. In the week after the attacks in New York and Washington, more hair-raising facts emerged. The terrorists had also obtained the code groups of the National Security Agency and were able to penetrate the NSA's state-of-the-art electronic surveillance system. They seemed to have at their disposal an electronic capability that was more sophisticated than the NSA. They also believe that the terrorists are in possession of all or part of the codes used by the Drug Enforcement Agency, the National Reconnaissance Office, Air Force Intelligence, Army Intelligence, Naval Intelligence, Marine Corps Intelligence, and the intelligence offices of the State Department and Department of Energy. Since no single individual has access to every top-level code at any given time, a single mole would not answer the case. It would have to be a large, widely spread number. U.S. experts do not believe bin Laden was capable of infiltrating double agents into the heart of the U.S. administration on a large scale. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Global Guardian, a mass Armageddon drill, was in full swing. The drill would pose all sorts of threats, and even mobilize command centers known as doomsday planes that housed top military personnel. Although originally scheduled for late October, it was moved up unexpectedly. One of these doomsday planes was on the scene of the Pentagon strike. Now to one of the eeriest moments amid the carnage of 9-11, a mysterious plane was seen flying right over the president's residence. Even some CNN staffers saw it. To this day, it has never been officially explained. Tonight, Chief National Correspondent John King has new details about this great 9-11 mystery. Today, six years after 9-11, the mystery endures about just what happened in the skies over the White House that terrible day. A plane flew right over it. But why? And what was it? It appeared overhead just before 10 a.m., a four-engine jet banking slowly in the nation's most off-limits airspace. About 10 minutes ago, there was a white jet circling overhead. Now, you generally don't see planes in the area over the White House. That is restricted airspace. Two government sources familiar with the incident tell CNN it was a military aircraft. They say the details are classified. This comparison of the CNN video and an official Air Force photo suggests the mystery plane is among the military's most sensitive aircraft, an Air Force E-4B. Note the flag on the tail, the stripe around the fuselage, and the telltale bubble just behind the 747 cockpit area. The E-4B is a state-of-the-art flying command post, built and equipped for one reason, to keep the government running no matter what, even in the event of a nuclear war, the reason it was nicknamed the Doomsday Plane during the Cold War. They exercise uh, this type of thing all of the time, and they simply don't talk about it. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that they, uh, that they are very closed-mouthed about it. Ask the Pentagon, and it insists this is not a military aircraft, and there is no mention of it in the official report of the 9-11 Commission. But six years later, the Pentagon, the Secret Service, and the FAA all say they, at least for public consumption, have no explanation of the giant plane over the president's house, just as the smoke began to rise across the river at the Pentagon. There is also footage of another white mystery plane in the restricted airspace over New York City before the second attack. And as the second plane strikes the World Trade Center. 